Okay, so in the final section on these regulatory type issues, I'm going to talk about FDA classification. So what happens in the US, which is quite different to what happens in Europe. Okay, so the, as I said, the FDA system of medical device classification is somewhat different to Europe and the medical device directive in Europe. So we, we will try and talk through that in the next few slides. What happens is uh, the FDA have divided medical devices into specific categories based on their function and they're, then they're assigned a specific CFR or Code of Federal Regulation citation number. We'll have a look at that in a moment. There's a wide range and list of medical devices classified and controlled. Um, so there aren't rules that are in the medical device directive that companies can follow. They need to, to, to check the, the CFR, the Code of Federal Regu uh, Red Regulations, and find their device. Uh, there's about 16 uh, different device categories, um, and then they're found in uh, in these parts, part uh, 868, 870. 872, etc. So, as I said, they're, they're device categories. So, anesthesiology devices, example, breathing frequency monitors, portable oxygen um, generators. So, you look in and you you get you get to your subchapter, and then you get to your device description. What best describes your device description? Here's some more examples, uh, and then you might uh, find something that uh, describes your device. So, this is an example of an ankle joint metal composite semi-constrained cemented prosthesis. Um, there's a little blurb about um, the, the technical details of it and there is a citation number and it's classified as class 2. So uh, if you want to market your device on the US market you need to go to this uh, code, um, code of Federal Regulations find your device and find its class. So these uh, 16 medical specialities are referred to as panels. Um, each of the generic types of devices is assigned to any one of three regulatory classes based on the level of control necessary to assure the safety and effectiveness of the device. So like the EU, there are three classes, class one, two, and three. Okay, but what might um, go as a class 2 device in Europe might be a class 3 in the US or vice versa. Um, so you can take it as a given that if you have a class 2A device in Europe, it will be a class 2 device in the US. This may not be the case. So the three classes are class 1 general controls uh, with exemptions, without exemptions, class 2 general controls and special controls with exemptions, without exemptions, and class three general controls and pre-market approval. Um, so what not exempt means um, is that the um, a 510k is required for marketing, which I will explain in a moment. So without exemptions means a 510k will be required for marketing. All devices classified as exempt are subject to limitations on these exemptions. Uh, so limitations um, are covered under the specific CFR code. Okay, so what that means, and when, when I explain 510k in a minute, it might make sense. So if it's not exempt, it's clear cut, you go get a 510k. Uh, if it is exempt, then you need to look at the limitations um, of the exemptions in the 21 CFR chapter. Okay, so this is CFR, I keep referring to as the Code of Federal Regulations. For Class 3 devices, a pre-market approval application or a PMA is required unless the device is a pre-amendments device, which means it's been on the market um, since before 1976. Okay, or it's a substantially equivalent to such a device and PMAs have not been called for. So uh, to, just to keep clarity, I, I've copied this directly from the FDA website. So what is a 510K? So if you remember, 510K uh, is typically used for class one, class two devices. Uh, what it is, is it's a pre-market submission. So before you market your device, you submit a file to the FDA that demonstrates your device is marketed 
uh, that to be that your device to be marketed is as safe and effective as a legally marketed device that is already on the market. So you are proving equivalence to a device that is already on the market. So it might be a new type of wound dressing and you look at the wound dressings that are on the market and you decide whether your device has equivalence to it. And there's lots of, of guidelines on how you uh, prove equivalence. You submit this file to the FDA and um, you can get a 510k which allows you to market your product. Okay, um, and, and this is the chapter of the CFR. So we're getting the idea that this Code of Federal Regulations is, is, is the document that uh, all regulatory um, responsibilities are laid out in. So submitters must compare their device to one or more legally marketed devices and make and support their substantial equivalency claims. Um, the FDA does not perform a 510 preclearance audit, so it's up to the manufacturer to prove equivalency. The FDA won't audit. However, after the 510k clearance is granted and the device is marketed, uh, the FDA uh, can inspect at any time. Okay, so if we go back to, to previous slides where we talked about uh, being exempt, uh, there may be some limitations that exist to that product, which will be outlined in the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, um, so pre-market approval then is to evaluate the safety and effectiveness of Class 3 uh, medical devices. The FDA has determined that general and special controls alone are insufficient to ensure the safety and effectiveness of Class 3 devices. The classification is the same as Europe, Class 1, 2, low to medium risk, Class 3, high risk devices, usually long term, fully implantable, um, and they use uh, typically the same criteria of um, intended use, duration of use, etc. So a PMA or pre-market approval is the most stringent type of device marketing application required by the FDA. The approval is based on a determined by the determination by the FDA that PMA contains sufficient valid scientific evidence to ensure the device is safe and effective for its intended use. Okay, so like um, in, for class two and three in the European, again, you need to prove that the device is safe and effective and you need to get a pre-market approval. And there's an extra arm to this, which is an investigative device exemption. And this allows the investigational device, so if it's a, it's a new device, which may, um, it, it hasn't, there's nothing on the market like it, and it may pose a risk, then you get an exemption, which allows you to use the device in a clinical study in order to collect safety and effectiveness data. Um, so if we have a look at this flow chart here, um, is your medical device low risk and exempt from intense pre-market evaluation? Then yes. Do you comply with good manufacturing practices? I'll talk about that in a moment. Yes. Then you can register it and list it. Okay. If it isn't low risk, but it's similar to previously approved legally marketed predicate devices, uh, then um, you go yes, if it's similar. Um, is there pre-market approval mandated by the FDA for this device? No, then you can get a substantially equivalent 510k application, which allows you market your device. If it's not similar to previously approved devices, uh, then you ask, does it pose a significant risk? If yes, you need to get an investigative device investigational device exemption application to allow you to perform clinical studies and then you can get pre-market approval notification or no you just get pre-market approval notification okay so that is the regulatory pathway so um as with europe and um, the, the code of federal regulations stipulates that a quality system must be complied with and um and this quality system regulation, so it's different to how we approach things. There's a quality system regulation that requires specifications and control to be established for medical devices.
devices be designed under a quality system to meet these specifications, devices be manufactured under quality systems, and finished devices meet these specifications. Devices must be correctly installed, checked and serviced. Quality data must be analysed to identify and correct quality problems and complaints be processed. So similar stuff that was in ISO uh, 13485, but it's in the quality system regulations. And the company must have a quality system. And in uh, the US, it's current good manufacturing practice. And uh, the requirements for current good manufacturing practice are in part 820 of the 21 CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, and what this um, current good manufacturing practice covers is the quality management, the organization, device design, buildings, equipment, purchasing and handling, production and processing controls, packaging and labeling, device evaluation, distribution and installation, complaint handling, servicing and records. So within uh, 21 CFR Part A20, this is where a company finds all of the information required um, that in order to set up a manufacturing facility, run it, how they train their staff, how they document things, how they handle complaints, etc, etc. Okay, so that was a very short snapshot. I suppose what I would like to uh, get across here is, is, is the difference between the EU and the US. It may provide difficulties to manufacturers who are um, supplying products to both markets. They have to comply with a different set of regulations. So within the EU, you're looking at your medical device directive and your ISO standards. Uh, within the US, uh, the Code of Federal Reg Regulations, um, uh, you classify your device differently and you um, have a different quality management system um, under part A20 of the CFR, which describes current good manufacturing practice. Okay, thank you.